hello everybody um we still have a few people connecting to audio that's good we'll wait for them to to join us it's good i think we've got everybody uh welcome thanks for being here for day three of reimagining possibilities restoring imagination nurturing creativity uh, we're really excited to have you here for the the final part of this series. Um, if you if this is your first time joining us, welcome. Uh, we are now more complete that you're here. Uh, if you have been joining us all along, thanks for sticking with us and uh, seeing it out till the end. Um, and hopefully, this was uh, this was a really motivating, engaging experience for you. Uh, just a few introductions uh, so that we know each other. Uh, my name is Jeff Austin. I use he, him pronouns, and I am a literacy consultant at Wayne Risa. I'm excited to co-present today with uh, Jennifer Snap. Jennifer, go ahead and introduce yourself. Good evening, everyone. I am Jennifer Snap. As Jeff said, I'm an educational improvement consultant. Welcome, welcome, welcome. We're so glad to have you and looking forward to working with you today. We're also joined by two more teammates who have been uh, part of this series and are amazing, brilliant colleagues to work with. Uh, we have uh, Dr. Laura Gabrion. Do you want to introduce yourself, Laura? Hi, everyone. Glad to learn with you tonight. And we have Dr. Rosalind Shaheen. Happy new school year, everyone. <laughs> I'm excited for you this year. Hopefully many of the things that we talked about, you'll be able to take back. Uh, I think you're in for a treat this evening. Uh, we always like to start with our land and labor acknowledgements. This land and labor acknowledgement was uh, crafted by an organization called Healing by Choice, which is a woman and gender non-conforming, a non-gender conforming organization uh, that promotes and prioritizes healing. We began by honoring the ancestral land on which we live. We are on the land of the Anishabe people of the three fires, the Ojibwe, the Ottawa, and the Potawatomi. Detroit is the largest majority Black city in the nation with a long legacy of African diasporic global contributions, which was once one of the last stops on the Underground Railroad, known by its codename Midnight. Detroit is also the U.S. city with the largest concentration of Arab Americans, a border city with historic and growing Latino and Latina communities, and a legacy of Asian American communities and movements. We acknowledge this land, its history, and all the beings seen and unseen, known and unknown, as we step into work on this land, most of us uninvited guests. We offer this acknowledgement in the spirit of reparation and devoting ourselves to justice as we strive to uplift and uphold the legacy of this land. Uh, today's agenda uh, is this. Uh, we're going to do a little free writing in a second. So uh, if you want to grab your phone, if you like to write on notes or if you've got your laptop with you and you want to uh, open a Google Doc or a Word Doc, uh, or you want to be like me and do it the old fashioned way with pen and paper, um, you can get ready for that. Uh, we're going to see, uh, today we're going to talk about students' identity in the classroom and how we bring that in. Um, and we talked about Essentials 1 and 9 last time. Um, we're going to do that again, and we're going to really see how it looks in practice. Um, and, and I'm really excited about uh, that component of, of, of this presentation to like really put it into action. Uh, we'll talk about some elegant next steps and uh, think about that alongside you. And then at the end, we'll talk about some opportunities for uh, us to learn together again this year, as we hope the summer blitz is not the last time um, we are together and uh, that your relationship with Risa doesn't end here. As always, uh, we have some working agreements. Um, one is demonstrate mutual respect. Two is to take a learner's stance. Three is to employ skillful listening. Four is to engage in humble inquiry. And five is to expect and accept non-closure. An hour goes really fast. Um, and there's only so much we can do here today, which is again why we're we, we hope to see you again um, and learn with you again. Um, if you wanna look at this list of working agreements and drop the number of your favorite working agreement in the chat, uh, that would be outstanding. Which one are you committing to today? All right, Jennifer is committing to three. That's good, employing skillful listening, great. Uh, a couple of twos here, which is taking a learner's stance. That's always great. Um, Yes, more skillful listening. That's awesome. Cool. Um, thanks, everybody. Uh, keep that in the back of your mind as we go forward. Um, 
we in this team are uh, big fans of setting our intentions and uh, going in with, uh, you know, uh, some really good things to ground ourselves in. And I think these working agreements are that. Thanks. One of the threads that we've tried to pull on in this series is the idea of Adrian Marie Brown's emergent strategy um, and how this can be a framework or uh, uh, some guidance for us to do the radical freedom dreaming that we've encouraged in this series um, and, and how to be really intentional about it. Um, so here again, we have the nine emergent strategy principles um, that Adrian Marie Brown lays out in her book. Uh, the first being small is good, small is all. The large is a reflection of the small. Two, change is constant, be like water. Three, there's always enough time for the right work. Four, there is a conversation in the room that only these people at this moment can have. Find it. Uh, that's one we'll be focusing on a little later today. Um, and I know that uh, it's one that we've um, lifted a few times in this series, um, but uh, that that's going to really highlight our time together today. Five is never a failure, always a lesson. Six is trust the people. If you trust the people, they become trustworthy. Seven is to move at the speed of trust. Focus on critical connections more than critical mass. Build resilience by building relationships. Eight is less prep, more presence. And nine is what we pay attention to grows. Uh, last time we were together, um, we really had you dig into these and think about how you were, again, setting some intentions for the year, for yourself, with your students. And, um, you know, keep that in mind, too, as you're going through the presentation today, um, you know, and thinking about what's resonating with you. Um, also acknowledging that what you may have picked last week may have shifted based on different events, or you might be focusing on something different today. That's okay, too. Um, so whatever you're zeroing in on there, uh, you can take with you through through the rest of today and um, through the rest of the year. Even We're going to give you a, a little writing time, as promised now. We'll take about five minutes here. Um, and we want to start with a quote by Miriam Kaba, who's a abolitionist um, and, uh, you know, uh, somebody I really admire and really respect and um, really love to read um, for all the good reasons about being pushed, being invited, being affirmed, being challenged. Um, I, I think her writing does all of that. Uh, she says, let's begin our abolitionist, abolitionist journey, not with the question, what do we have now and how do we make it better? Instead, let's ask, what can we imagine for ourselves and the world? If we do that, then boundless possibilities for a more just world await us. So if you think about this quote um, and, and what she's asking us to do, um, write for about five minutes about what kind of classroom you would build if you could start over and you weren't bound by any existing structures or mandates. This is part of that freedom dream, right? This is part of thinking about what's possible. Um, so we're going to ask you to take five minutes. Try to compose for the entire time. You do not need to write paragraphs or sentences. There is no test. You will not be graded or anything like that. Um, so you can write. You can just think and reflect for five minutes. You can sketch. You might record your thoughts and uh, uh, verbally. Any way that you feel really good about doing that um, it is good with us. So at three fifteen, we'll 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 come back together and um, talk a little bit about what we what we wrote about. So um, go ahead and uh, think about that. We're going to take about uh, thirty more seconds. Um, to finish up what we're writing or sketching or recording. As you're doing that, um, I'm going to ask you to look back at whatever you thought or written or recorded and think about one thing that's kind of standing out to you um, as you're writing this. Um, you might have surprised yourself about where this went. Uh, and I know this quote's very uh, expansive and difficult to digest in five minutes, but um, again, <laughs> keep coming back to it. Expect and accept non-closure. 
Um, so I, I'm going to ask you to think about one thing that's kind of standing out to you about what you wrote. And in about 10 seconds, um, I'm going to ask you to share that in the chat with us. All right. So if you wouldn't mind sharing one idea or phrase or word or theme from your work that that stood out and what you're dreaming about and what you would put in place. Uh, we'd really appreciate it. We'll wait for those to kind of come in and see what we have. A classroom that is equitable, where students can advocate for themselves and truly have a voice. Thank you. That's really beautiful. Advocacy is such important work for us and for our students. Um, so giving them platforms and structures to practice and to be those advocates, that's that's really incredible. Thank you. Flexibility and more time and choice for students. Yeah, sometimes our students' days are really locked in and um, they don't get to choose a lot of what they do. So thinking about how to be flexible and how to provide more choice is really critical. Variety is the spice of life. We need to bring more variety in and out of the classroom. Yeah. Um, We'll, we'll get back to the disciplinary literacy essentials in a second, but that's part of, I think, the hope of that document, right, is that we, we are kind of um, thinking about what's interesting, what's hot, what's engaging right now, um, what do students want to talk about, and what do they want to think about, what do they want to write about, what do they want to, uh, what do they, what do they want to hear more about? Um, I think that's really exciting. Thank you. A classroom that centered students more and content and correctness less. The danger of a single standard and, and thinking about how much um, of our education profession and, and our students' experience relies on judgment and um, single standards. So that's, that's important. Um, building relationships with students and engaging classroom free of, there you go, free of judgments. Thank you. Yeah, that's, that's really wonderful too. Um, Judgment is sometimes so baked into the teaching profession. It's hard for us to imagine teaching without judgment, but I think that's part of the freedom dream because if we can free ourselves of that and students can free themselves of that, I think we're in a better place. A classroom where everyone is accepted and differences are embraced with many different ways of learning, meeting students where they really are. That's beautiful too. It's part of that student-centeredness and... Um, student choice and flexibility. I think all these things are kind of factoring together. So thanks for sharing those. Those are like beautiful visions of the future um, that we can make possible. And I will talk a little bit about how today too. So we've mentioned also alongside emergent strategy, these disciplinary literacy essentials. Um, this is a document uh, that uh, has come out of really that student advocacy piece. Um, Jamaria Hall and his classmates at Osborne High School, um, thinking about what it means to be literate, suing the governor, uh, and, you know, really forcing us to say, you know, what what is literacy? What does this look like? The disciplinary literacy essentials are really designed to create the enabling conditions for you to do everything that you just put in the chat. Um, they are a facilitating document to say, these are good practices. We do need flexibility. We do need choice. We do need humanizing spaces. And we've got the research and evidence and experience to prove it. So if um, you're teaching this way and somebody asks, why are you doing this? And, and, and what, what is this based on? Um, this is a document that you can go back to and say, it's, it's really based on these disciplinary literacy essentials. Um, because, you know, in their truest form, in their truest vision, they are um, helping us think about what steps we need to take to create those responsive, humanizing and joyful environments where all the things that we've just written about and all the things that we've just talked about are possible. Um, so the document is only as good as we enact it. Um, and uh, otherwise, it's just kind of words on a page. So you know, um, us working together to think about like, what does a, a better world, what does a more humanizing world, what does a more just world, what does a world free of judgment, what does a flexible world, what do those things look like? 
and what do they mean in practice? That's what we're kind of hoping to do today. But um, this document, you know, it, it, it's important to see it as a vision for, for what could be. And it, it kind of gives us a pathway to enact that vision, um, which is, for me, what's really exciting about it and, and, and why I believe in it and um, talk about it. None of us would talk about things we didn't believe in. So um, this is definitely uh, something that we believe in. Um, I just wanted to point out two essentials that we've talked about throughout our time together as well. Um, the first one is essential number one. Essential number one is the foundational essential. Um, I know we keep bringing this back up, but it's really important to remember that the other essentials are not possible really without um, number one alongside them. Um, so that number one is problem-based instruction. You might hear it referred to in, in, in many different ways, phenomenon-based or inquiry, um, whatever. We're kind of driving at the same things, right? Um, and you can see some of the things that we've lifted here in our time together already today are included in uh, number one. So um, connecting to students' lives, um, being at being advocates and being um, able to communicate publicly about needs, interests, wants, um, those things, student choice, compelling reasons. These things are all really uh, critical to enacting a problem-based classroom and, and living into essential one. We also talked about essential nine and tapping into the available funds of knowledge that uh, students have um, to teach our content and to further their skills and to um, really create lifelong learners. Um, so you have things here about creating family, uh, tapping into family histories, creating avenues for um, families to be involved in the learning processes in school, um, leveraging um, community knowledge and peer connections. Um, number nine is, uh, in my, my, my personal opinion, a really beautiful essential. And um, I think one of the ones that we really need to work hard into like enacting and, and, and really dreaming into existence and building together because um, it can sometimes be hard or, or challenging to think about how in the course of your day and in the course of your time, how to do this work. And again, that's kind of what we're thinking about today. So I said, we've come back to this and here we are. Um, there is a conversation in the room that only these people at this moment can have, find it. Again, one of the emergent strategy principles and the reason that we're bringing this one back in particular today is because um, when we think about that essential number nine, I think we often think outside of the classroom and, and there's value in that. Like, I'm going to bring in my local historian. We're going to go to a museum. But oftentimes the answer is right in the room with you. And that community connection doesn't require you to necessarily bring in anybody out from outside or, or go anyplace else. The world is kind of coming to you and all these funds of knowledge are in your room and just finding the way to use them and to leverage them and to honor them and to amplify them is really the goal. So you have a classroom of kids. They're all really awesome. They have brilliance and funds of knowledge. Um, and, and there's a conversation there to have right in the classroom. So how do we find that conversation and use it to do all the things that Essential 9 is asking us to do? Um, that's really kind of what we're after here today. And the, the last part of this series is, um, what does it mean to do the work of creating community and looking no further than the people that were around, the people in our orbit every day. So I'm going to turn it over to Jennifer because um, she's going to walk us through some really brilliant ideas that are um, implementable tomorrow in, in, in lots of ways and um, can really unlock that ninth, uh, ninth essential. Um, and I am so excited for her to talk about these, and I think you will be too. So Jennifer. Thanks, Jeff. Hello, everyone. 
So we all know that our students have phones. Most students have an iPhone, Android. They have some type of device that they can use. So what better way of using that um, phone instead of saying, put it away, use photography to embed students' identity as well as their community. So it's a, such a powerful tool. You know how we always say a picture is worth a thousand words. Sometimes we look at a snapshot and we have to wonder what happened before and what happened afterwards. Words. So we can activate academic discourse amongst our students if we use pictures that they have taken, and it also lifts their voices um, in any type of project-based learning. And so I just want to lift this from Essential 9, connect to and engage with discipline-related activities and spaces in local communities. So for example, Jeff talked about you know the museum. Well, some students, they may go to the museum um, on the weekend. So tell them if you're going to a museum, some type of university or something, whatever you're doing on the weekend, take some pictures, bring it back. Tell us a story about it. Um, how does that connect to something that you may have been studying um, in the classroom? You can go ahead and advance. Lord, thank you. So this one, I love photographic introductions. You know, on the first day of school, we're always trying to um, get our students to introduce themselves. So it may, it may not be the first day of school, but it may be the first week of school, um, or it could be the first day of school. What do they have in their phone? A lot of times they have selfies. They have things that interest them. Um, it could be TikTok. It could be art. Um, I put in bowling because I like to bowl. Um, you know, we have a lot of students that love to cook. They love music. So what better way to allow them to share some of their clean photos in their phones um, to introduce themselves? And then they could, we could strike conversations um, in small groups or, you know, elbow to elbow or whole group and have their classmates tell a little bit about that particular person after they share their videos. Um, if you don't wanna do it on the first day, perhaps they can do it um, the second or the third day. They can send the photos to you and maybe you could create some type of PowerPoint or have them do it depending upon the age. Um, I forgot, this is secondary, so that would be good. Thanks, Laura. And so here, um, this one is the identity exploration. Um, you know, we are like a big puzzle. Um, so allow your students to take pictures that symbolize different aspects of their identity, um, their gender, their ethnicity, religion, their hobbies. Um, we're trying to put all the pieces together so that they can express themselves um, through digital photography, as well as through the content that you're teaching. If you want students to lift their voices, um, give them some pictures and let them talk about the pictures. Let them put the pieces together. Thank you, Laura. All right, and here, this is a cultural photo collage. I love this one because even though we may, uh, a lot of your students may look alike, they come from different backgrounds. So let them dig deep. Let them talk about um, their cultural history, their backgrounds and traditions and heritages. And where does that come from? Um, what are some things that they could actually pick up? And this is lifted in Essential 9. Help students connect and build on in-school and out-of-school um, literacy practices and their identities. Uh, when they um, leave school on the weekend, you know, what is their religion? What are some of the things that they practice? Let them talk about that. How does that connect again to the content that is being taught in the class? Connect to youth and popular cultural activities and concerns. Um, last summer, I was walking in Farmington with one of my, um, my girlfriends, and we kept seeing um, these children running and we kept looking at each other like, oh my goodness, why are these children running in this park by themselves? Because they were going into a wooded area. And so there was a group um, of Indian people and they were having a religious study session and they were also bringing in lots of food and it was just really cool. And they invited us to come and kind of look, but we didn't want to impose. But that was just great because you just don't know what is going on within your local communities. So that would have been a great um, picture. That would have been worth probably 10,000 words, if not more. And so we want to embrace um, all of our backgrounds and traditions and heritages. And when they can see themselves 
in the, the, the context of a classroom, if you have um, supplementary material or even the curriculum, then they feel more valued, they feel humanized, and we want them to be able to see that they belong um, in our classrooms. Right, advances line, thank you. So this one, this is something that our colleague, um, Dr. Shahid had shared with us and I thought it was great to put into this part because we have narrative photography, which tells a story through a series of photographs or a video compilation. Um, so it also identifies some type of historical event, social event or a personal story. And of course you can add to that. So Laura, let's take um, the next two and a half minutes to watch this video. Thank you. What are some of the themes that you could pull out of that video alone to talk about? Something that's aligned with something that you've been teaching, a social justice issue? Go ahead. And how does that align to Essential 9? Feel free to unmute your device. You know, as people are thinking, I, I think this really um, dovetails really nicely with um, what we had talked about last week in terms of um, the power of place-based learning. Um, you know, this is clearly, um, something that's deeply rooted in community, right? Um, and we talked last week about those two quotes, right? Um, one is we don't fight for places we don't love. Um, so Elijah clearly loves his place, mm -hmm. um, and is fighting for it. And then the other quote that we had was, um, you have to acknowledge both the beauty and the blight. And um, I think it's this really powerful example of like loving your place, but also like acknowledging the flaws, acknowledging the problems, and then being willing to fight for an advocate solution. So I think it's really powerful that way. Yeah. Thanks, Jeff. I think people just need time to type it in. Thank you, Kim. She says issue with climate and the effects that it is having on certain, if not all communities. Absolutely. Valerie, global warming and how it affects the elderly and youth and how students can relate to it within their communities, absolutely. So we can also use the videos. Um, students can take their pictures and turn them into videos. And I'll talk a minute about, in a minute about scissor reels. Thank you. So on this one, um, I kind of pulled something from the essential, uh, essential one, um, helping students make sense of problems at different scales. Thank you, Kelly and Leela. All right, to persevere in solving them or make conjectures about solutions. So if we look at photography um, and making connections to the local community and engaging them, what are some of the things that they may, uh, may see? What are some of the problems that they may have in their communities that they want to address or advocate for? Um, they may want to advocate for um, hunger or homelessness, like Jeff was saying earlier, they may want to clean up the blight in their community. Maybe they want more diversity. Maybe they want more employment opportunities. Maybe they want, they see a landmark and they want to do something different or make more land, landmarks more meaningful in their communities. And so how can they partner with local organizations and community members in order to create these projects that address specific issues or topics? All right, Laura, can you advance? Thank you so much. And I want to acknowledge the other comments that were in the chat. Kelly said, you appreciate the metaphors and assemblies, higher order thinking, great. And Leela says, a very personal reaction to global warming and its effect on community. Thank you so much for that. And so we want students to write, right? Well, sometimes they don't know how to get started or they don't know how to extend their thoughts. Well, we have photography journaling. That's just simply using photography as a form of journaling, capturing moments, um, emotions, daily experiences. Our students know how to use emojis. <laughs> so it um, this one here um, at the bottom, I said, provides regular opportunities for students to make choices in their reading their writing and their communications. And so that comes from the essentials as well. So make sure that you're providing technical guidance. Of course, you know that, or photography techniques or digital tools. Maybe you can pull in the art teacher to, 
art teacher to help um, with that and making sure that you are um, having discussions in the classrooms that are framed um, in a respectful and inclusive manner so that all students are um, feeling humanized again. And consider the diversity of the students who are in front of you, consider the diversity of their identities um, that are in your classroom. And as an educator, we all know that we must create dynamic um, and engaging learning environments. And this is just another way to do that so that we can celebrate the differences um, within our classrooms as well as the unity that's of the students that's in, that are in front of you. All right, Jeff, that's me. That's the end of mine. I'll turn it back over to you. Thank you so much. Thanks. What I, what I really loved about um, all the things that Jennifer shared is um, how I think important it is to invite the world into your classroom. Um, I think a lot of times there's um, a certain division that happens between school and community or school and home or, um, and, and really um, that can get in the way of a lot of things that um, the essentials are asking us to do. Right. Um, so, you know, uh, I, I think the encouragement here that, that we're, we're offering is to, um, you know, not be afraid to bring the world into your classroom, bring those big questions into your classroom and, and really, um, really dig into them with students. I think that's the, you know, that that's really, um, the bread and butter of essentials one and nine. Um, there, there's a big world out there and, and so much to explore, um, and as we said earlier, the, you know, the students are bringing the world to you. They are the world in many cases. Um, so, you know, we can think about what that means. And I, I think Jennifer shared a lot of really great ways for us to um, think about that. All right. So one thing that we want to have you do here, um, and again, we'll give you a little bit of time to do this, is um, go back to think about your radical freedom dream. Um, go back to thinking about all of the things that you would do if there were no structures and there were, you know, we could start over kind of a zero based system and think about small things that you can do. Um, Adrian Ray Brown calls these elegant next steps. The smallest things that you can do to begin to make your vision a reality. Remember small is good. Small is all. Um, so what's the smallest thing that you can do to make that a reality and start there? If we try to start with the biggest thing that we can possibly do, it's obviously not going to work out, right? Um, so we need to start with the smallest thing that we're, we can possibly do to make that vision that we had um, written about a, a reality. So here's what I'm going to ask you to do. If you're able, if you're not, you can do this a little bit later on, um, but... Uh, I'm going to ask you to open up your email and set an intention. We talked about that today too. In the email, type the small step that you are going to take to make your vision a reality and schedule that email to send at a different time. Maybe it's a week from now. Maybe it's a month from now. Um, and uh, you... Uh, we'll get that reminder when you need it. You know your cadence. You know how the school year goes for you. So if you feel like I need that reminder in October, schedule it for sometime in October to send to you. And it'll pop up. And that will be a great reminder of this is part of my purpose this year. This is part of my vision. This is part of why I'm enacting. So we'll give you uh, about five minutes to go ahead and... Um, if you're able, I know some people are driving or mobile. If you're able, type an email to yourself and schedule it to send when you feel like you're going to need it the most to remind yourself of your intention and purpose around this this year. Uh, check in again at uh, with you around um, 348 or 349. So about four or five minutes. All right. We're going to take about 30 more seconds to kind of finish up. What I'm going to ask you to do is to um, put in the chat the most elegant next step, the smallest step that you're going to take to achieve your radical freedom dream this year, because um, we would love to hear 
what you're planning and what you're thinking about um, and, and, and how that vision that you set out at the beginning of our time together today is going to come to life. I'm sorry. What did you just ask? I'm sorry. Oh, could you, could you just put your, um, could you just put the step that you're going to take this year in the chat? How are you going to make your, how are you going to make that uh, dream that we wrote about at the beginning come to life? And while we're thinking about that, I love this Adrian Marie Brown, a uh, little poem uh, that, that, that she has about, keeping things small and keeping our eyes kind of on the prize uh, and not trying to go too big, too global, too fast. If you can't see the small, you will keep leaping from built thing to built thing, begging the sky to rain on you. You'll become a tyrant, reaching, shuffling the cards until you see only your vision, massive, but no one else can see it. Laura uh, says that her small step to uh, on her journey and her freedom dream this year is persistence, right? Um, lots of things will try to cause us to give up, but we are going to be persistent this year with Laura. Other things that come up for you? Allow myself and students to step outside the box. Laura, this makes me think we should have put that swimming pool diagram in, right? Um, you have to be comfortable and your students have to be comfortable with where they are um, in order to do it. Um, so, yes. Adapt a few projects and assignments with more student choice. That's a great step. That's brilliant. Uh, I was with a group of teachers last Monday and we were talking about um, just even, it, you know, again, depending on where you are in that choice process and thinking about it, even just adapting modalities can be a, a way like maybe students are recording something. Maybe some are writing something. Um, so giving them a choice on how they're presenting information can be really good. Um, oh, great, a counselor. Uh, I'm going to try to develop lessons a bit different in a different way, viewing different... Yeah, that just changing perspectives sometimes is really great. Uh, that can be really key in getting kids talking, getting kids thinking. Um, I know that one of the things that I always like to do is to um, try to get students to disagree with things that they were reading and thinking about um, those counter arguments because um, so often students will default to agreement with whatever it is that they're they're encountering. And I think part of disciplinary literacy is, is um, not only giving them access to all that rich information and all those rich viewpoints, but um, giving them the space and time and skills and um, courage to question and uh, critique and add to. Uh, collaborate with my students to come up with class norms and things that they would like to see take place within our classroom by giving them a voice. Um, practice, 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 right? Um, how do students get to be good advocates? Practice. Um, so by giving them that space and giving them time, they figure out what works, what doesn't work. Um, that's really beautiful. These are all amazingly uh, great things. I know that they're small, but they all take lots of courage and it's so amazing to hear each of you um, share and, and see how each of you are um, thinking about what you're going to do this year. So we're, we're so appreciative um, that you're doing that. Um, and remember, small is all. Small is good. It's okay. Um, if you are if you have a ladder with rungs that are too far apart, you'll never climb more. All right. Um, so small is good. All right. Um, thank you for sharing. We really appreciate that. Uh, just a couple of things as we uh, wrap up here today that we want to bring your attention to. Um, we need each other. We know that. Um, I, I We talked about Miriam Kaba at the beginning. I, I think she would tell us there's no such thing as a solo abolitionist. So um, it's, a, it's a team sport. Uh, so we need each other. And these are ways that we can continue our relationship together this year. Uh, and we, we'd love to see you again. You're all doing such amazing uh, work. Um, and, and we want to continue to amplify that, um, share your successes with you, support you in your challenges. Um, one of the ways that uh, we can do that is through our equity-focused literacy series. Uh, every year, uh, there's an amazing lineup of people that come uh, and share their knowledge and support with us, and this year's no different. Uh, Deb Walter, uh, Maisha Wynn, uh, uh, you know, the list goes on and on and on. So if you're interested in thinking a little bit more about um, what literacy looks like in an equity-focused way, please join us. Uh, Felicia Rose Chavez is going to be here too. Um, she wrote the um, anti-racist writing workshop. 
Uh, that's going to be a great series. We have our responsive assessment network running. Um, Laura, Heather Rotterman, and I will uh, be involved in that. Um, our work kicks off in October, on October 12th. Um, David Buck is going to be here. He's going to talk about compassionate grading and assessment. Um, I think that uh, there's going to be a lot to get out of that. And then um, finally, we have our equity-based disciplinary literacies network. Um, if you're really intrigued by this document and thinking like, okay, I, I need a community of practice to help me think about how to implement these disciplinary literacy essentials in a culturally responsive, relevant, and sustaining way. We got you covered. Um, Laura will be there. Uh, Roz will be there. I'll be there along with our uh, other colleagues in math and science and social studies. So no matter what you do, um, we've got a place for you at EBDLN. Uh, the registration links are on the screen and uh, the contact information or the point person for each of those is also on the screen. So you can Take a screenshot, take a picture, but uh, as as I've said many, many times, uh, we don't want your relationship, Teresa, to end here today because uh, we need each other. Um, and uh, on behalf of Laura, Jennifer, Roz, and uh, I, I just want to say that we wish you the very best for a great school year. And we uh, we're, we're, as always, admiring and in awe of all the things that you do. Uh, with and for students every day. So have a great year, everybody. Uh, feel free to sign up for any and all of these, uh, and we will uh, see you around. Have a great afternoon. Thank you.